stones and uh, we'll have to uh, have peace with that. Well, James, I uh, <coughs> hardly recognise myself, though of course I do recognise the quotes from the great writers. Thank you for betraying uh, the suspicion that you've actually read the book, which is wonderful, because often reviewers, you know, they just review books without having read them. But that was absolutely marvellous, and thank you very much. And while I'm at it, uh, thank you all for coming. I must say that there are some good bits in this book, but all the good bits are, are not by me. Uh, all the good bits are quotes from the blokes what, what I talk about, you know. So, for instance, you get Samuel Johnson. In fact, I, I'm, I'm not as good as this as you are, James, but uh, I'll give you a few examples. You get Sam Johnson, who was confronted after he had published at long last his dictionary, which he did single-handed in a very short time, where it took the French Academy 40 scholars over 30 years to produce their version. And what a language that is, you know? And these two Methodist ladies came up to Sam and said, uh, Sir, we see that you've left out the rude words. And he said, Madam, he said, I see you've been looking for them. <laughs> <laughs> he, was a, he was a wonderful man. Uh, on his way back from church on Good Friday, uh, he confesses, Lord, in the year that you have spared me, I am no better than I was. I have made no amendment to my life. Good old Sam. He was a good thing. And the next up, uh, you have a fellow with another Sam. You have Sam Coleridge, who Charles Lamb described as an archangel, a little damaged. <laughs> and Byron said of him, lately Samuel Coleridge has taken wing, explaining metaphysics to the nation. I wish he would explain his explanation. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk a bit about Eliot because uh, I think, uh, along with Charles Sisson, uh, Eliot has probably had an undue uh, influence on me. He has a, a reputation for obscurity and uh, elitism. Uh, to the second of those charges, there, there, is, there is no possible defense because he was an elitist. And, and the alternative to being an elitist, of course, is to be a mediocritist. And so why bother? But so the idea that he was obscure, I would, I would direct you to the wasteland. I would direct you to, to the pub scene. You know, the bit where he captures entirely the language of the East End pub. Hurry up, please, it's time. Hurry up, please, it's time. Hurry up, please, it's time. He keeps repeating this. And he has a, he was the first man to have that complete, under, after Dickens, of course, he was the master of it to have that complete understanding of the demotic, which was so plagiarized and, and traduced into a kind of leftish political philosophy by such gits as Harold Pinter. <laughs> <laughs> Read Eliot for that understanding of the demotic. Read him also for tenderness. Again in the Wasteland, if you turn on a few pages, uh, you, two pages actually, uh, you get to the scene of the typist when her boorish lover turns up. <coughs> and, you know, it's a bit like that thing of Lynn Truss eats, shoots and leaves. I mean, he's, he's, he's not bothered. He just comes in. He does what he wants. When lovely lady stoops to folly, and she puts another record on the gramophone. There is a, such exquisite tenderness in T.S. Eliot. I don't know whether it, I'm not a, I'm not a psychiatrist and I don't want to be, whether it's something to do with his strained relationship with Viv and his even more strained relationship with Bertrand Russell, but, you know, there you have it. Uh, Eliot is, is not some kind of uh, aloof academic, far from it. All his language is incarnated. And that's the whole thing about these people. Uh, all of them are conservatives, but they were all the most profound innovators. And it makes sense. You can't start to innovate from a position of knowing nothing about the past. 
You can only do a successful innovation. You can only create a successful revolution if you thoroughly understand the past. Mm -hmm. And that's what all these chaps, what, what they all did. I mean, Tiggy Hill goes so far as to say, I am not a conservative, I am a reactionary. <laughs> Tiggy Hill, by the way, was the only man in the world who had a knuckle duster <coughs> that was actually made for him by Gaudier Breschka, which is quite <coughs> nice, isn't it? You know, if you're meeting any romantic poets on the street, you know, you want something yeah, you know, to, to, to hit them with. Tiggy Hill also made the, the unfashionable remarks about the Enlightenment and the Reformation. Uh, you know, all this wonderful Renaissance art that we're supposed to admire. Well, it's very nice, isn't it? This kind of humanistic Disneyland. I mean, what, what Hume said about it was that the, the, the great art belonged to something that meant something which was about the true human condition, which is that we are beset by original sin, that we fail, and that we need a savior. And then he says, remarkably, he said, what Renaissance art suggested for the first time was that after all, humanity was quite satisfactory. You know, all those nymphs and the fields and the lovely figures of the man. Oh, they're lovely, aren't they? They're beautiful, the outlines, the exquisite craftsmanship. But craftsmanship is not art. Art is truth. And if you want to know who told you the truth, then you go to Giotto, you go to Plato, you go to Thomas Aquinas, you go to Wyndham Lewis, you go to T.S. Eliot, you go to R.G. Collingwood, and some of these other people that I have dared to mention. What can I say about C.S. Sisson except that uh, I think I profited more from Charles um, th th than anybody. Charles had this ability to put his finger on exactly what it was that was worrying him. I used to send him poems, foolishly. Mm. I, I sent him the first novel that I wrote, and he wrote back about it, and, and made some very, very nice comments about it. But he always just put his, foot, his finger exactly on the spot that was worrying him. The question that you wanted answered, he answered it. Whereas most people that you talk to, they they want to sympathize, uh, and so they soft soap, and, and they don't really know. Charles put his finger exactly on it. He, Charles is he's the master of, of every genre in the 20th century, of poetry, of the novel. He wrote a book called The Spirit of Public Administration. He retired, or rather got the sack from the civil service after writing three articles in The Spectator about the folly of Robert Armstrong, who was then in charge of the civil service. <laughs> so I feel that I'm sort of following in his footsteps. I sent a copy of this book to the bishop. I thought it might make a, an alternative bit of reading, you know, from The Guardian. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, once in a while over his porridge and uh, in moves it or whatever he has. Um, Charles had this wonderful technique of saying things that were exact. Like, for instance, just one phrase that springs to mind, that unfortunately the choice of words determines what is being said. <laughs> Hume wrote, Eliot published all Hume's poetry. Hume, by the way, died with just about the last shell that was fought, fired in the First World War. And, and Eliot published all his poetry. And there are only about 23 poems, and they are very short poems. Like this one. Old houses were scaffolding once, and men whistling. Now, if you want to know what a poem is, if you ever want to ask what a poem is, that is exactly what a poem is. Because it, it completely concretizes a, a, a scene, an image, and an emotion along with it. Which is exactly what Coleridge did in, in the ancient manner in, in, in Zanadu. Art is not something which is abstract and up there and intellectual. Above all, art is the very antidote to academia. Art is something which is absolutely in here. It is concrete, but it is the mind as concrete. It's not some kind of emotive thing like the Romantics vainly believe. 
you can't just drift out and, and drowsily write some poem and expect that it will be any good. You have to engage your mind, but your mind also has to be coupled with your affection, with what the New Testament in St. John calls, calls love. This is no less than what that same uh, glorious uh, apostle calls the Logos, the divine reason. Because the divine reason itself is incarnate. I should say a word about Collingwood, and then it, I'll shut up. I was hoping that James would go on for longer. Save me the bother. Um, Collingwood is, is, is an absolute master. Uh, it, I mean, it, read him for his prose. Read the essay on metaphysics, in which he demonstrates, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that one cannot build uh, science on anything other than metaphysics. Because this, the observable world that we see, the, the world that Dawkins looks at and thinks he understands, is not explainable in its own terms. As Immanuel Kant said, you know, you have to have uh, certain fundamental presuppositions. He called it fancy words like synthetic a priori. But you have to have this idea, we can't get away from it, space, time, and causality. And these are not deducible or observable or provable by recoursing to your experience. These are absolute presuppositions. And science, uh, no less than theology, depends on these absolute presuppositions. Collingwood is also actually very good. I love that uh, thing that uh, James quoted about the cackling goose. He also he wrote this wonderful book called The New Divine. In which he, he said was his contribution to the war. He wrote, published this in 1940 uh, when he was dying and he was on his way back from the Far East. He was given a special boat, uh, desk on a boat coming back. And he wrote this book about the barbarisms that inflict, have inflicted themselves on the Western world. And the he, he first barbarism, he said, was Islam. I mean, Coleridge agreed with that, by the way. Um, his second barbarism was the Germans, the Prussian militarism, and the, the third one was the Second World War, the, 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 Nazi, the rise of power of the Nazis. But Collingwood appeals to me mostly because of his understanding of the past of history. He wrote a wonderful book of excavating Ro Roman Britain. Apart from his philosophical things, he wrote a wonderful book about uh, what art is really about, uh, called The Enchantment. He wrote another book called The Idea of History, which is a magnificent understanding of the metaphysics of history, which just takes apart these people like Hegel. I mean, one of the only decent things that Bertrand Russell ever said was that you know, the, the, the absolute is having a hell of a problem unraveling itself endlessly trying to understand Hegel. But Collingwood said, people think that just because folks lived a long time ago that they were stupid. So they thought, you know, the normal anthropological thing that you get, you know, on your average BBC for documentary is that these people did rain dances because they thought it would make it rain. You know, they weren't so stupid. Then Collingwood says they, they knew that eventually it would rain anyway. But he says, look, my father employed a serving maid and she would never light a fire without saying, burn up fire, burn up fire, burn up fire. And she would never boil a kettle without saying, boil up kettle, boil up kettle, boil up kettle. But that wouldn't make her be anything less than completely diligent in laying the fire, and preparing it properly, and putting the kettle on the hob and filling it with water and turning on the heat. These things, he said, all these chants, all these rain dances, all this primitive nonsense, they were songs of encouragement, rather like the sorts of things that people sing in football matches. But not fine, but yeah, those were those kind of things. Chesterton, um, well, he's just immeasurable, isn't he? I mean, where, where do you go with Chesterton? I mean, a man who can say that, I found myself in a wood in Yorkshire, surrounded by a policeman. 
Yeah. He's just a sentence to die for, isn't it? <laughs> he, he tells this wonderful story about his, about his grandfather. He said who never said much in his life. He, he thought his, his grandfather only spoke about seven words in his whole life. He said eventually he got very, very old indeed, and, and he used to sit in the fireplace uh, on a Sunday evening. He said, and all these fashionable people came around and talked about metaphysics and theology and politics and, you know, all the rest of it. And uh, they were all discussing one evening, they were discussing the general thanksgiving and the book of common <coughs> prayer. And they were saying that, well, well, you know, we don't really think that there's much to be thankful for, you know, this horrible way that the world has dealt with us and so on. And Chesterton said, Grandpa roused himself from sleep that was almost near his final demise. And he said, I should give thanks for my existence, even if I knew I was a lost soul. And he's just, he, he is deep like that. As James said, he wrote, uh, regarded by Catholic theologians, he wrote the best book on, um, on Thomas Aquinas. And then you, well, who else did I mention? Uh, Newman? Are you only going to read his hymns? Praise to the holiest in the heights, lead kindly right, firmly I believe and truly. If you know those three hymns, that's all you need to know about Christian theology. The rest is bluff and bluster. It's all there in those three hymns. Take you about five minutes to learn. You probably know them already anyway. I think I've, I've said enough actually. Um, Again, it's, it's very nice of you to come. We, we do have a little time. We, we have quite a bit of time, actually. And I'd much rather spend the, the time that's left to us to answer any uh, questions and criticisms. Thank you very much.